What's it like to be back in Culture Club? It's the same as it ever was, really. Do you know what I mean? I don't think people really change that much. I think everybody's personalities are very much the same as they were 13 years ago. I mean, that was the ironic thing about meeting up for the first time, is that everybody was exactly the same. The same jokes, <laughs> you know, the same sense of humour, the same things, you know, that annoyed each other. But I think what happens is that you get older and you become, hopefully, a little bit, a little bit more tolerant, not completely, but a little bit more tolerant of each other. And uh, you allow people to be who they want to be and keep your arguments to a minimum, minimum. I'm having a lot more fun than I used to. For me personally, the experience is much better. I think everybody has grown quite a lot. In, in, um, in, in experience and just life skills, you know, and I think that's enabled us to do this because we, the, you know, we can, not just in tolerance, but just in, I really enjoy these guys now because I've accepted over the years that, you know, this is a really important thing in my life. These guys meant a lot to me and um, this is a, a, a very special thing to have in your life, a, you know, a group of guys that you really did something special with, wrote great songs with, and to be able to get the chance to go out again, you know, in your late 30s and do what you did when you were 24 is a wonderful thing. You know, it's like, ah, I could do it again with what I know now. And that's a great thing. If you could do that in every relationship in your life, you know, I'm doing it with my relationship with these guys, but if you do any relationship, it'd be a great thing. So I'm... I think it's a lot different and I'm having much more fun than I used to. <laughs> I think out of all of us, I think George has probably changed the most. I think uh, he's, um, he's a hell of a lot more experienced now and a lot more competent in a way. He finds his way around studios and uh, the technical side of being in a band um, a lot easier now, I think. And I'm not as neurotic as He's not as neurotic. And, That's a big and, one. And, and, I mean, think, and, and, no. Roy, and Roy and I sleep together now. <laughs> no, I, think, I think things do... St- I think you still get annoyed by the same things, you know, and the same things about each other's personalities can be quite grating, especially on a long tour. But you walk away now, or you respond differently, you go and read a book, or you wait for the right opportunity to have a row or a conversation. Although, I must say, Roy and I did have a huge fight where was it? It was on Detroit. Ro- on my birthday. It was Roy's birthday in Detroit, and I got a bee in my bonnet about one of the songs being played badly, and, and sort of screamed at Roy, and um, we had one of our classic screaming rows. But then we laughed, which is something we never would have done in the past. I mean, we were able to <laughs> say, <laughs> no, we were able to say, <laughs> I'm sorry, I shouted at you. I'm sorry, I shouted at you. You know, and, and it was sort of funny. Why now for the reunion? I think the first thing was that the wedding singer came out in America, which was like a pastiche of the 80s, and they used one of our songs. And then this artist called Mace used a bit of Do You Really Want to Hurt Me? And then someone else did something in Jamaica, and there was all these kind of references to the 80s involving us. And then VH1 did this thing called Behind the Music, which the rest of the guys hated, which I loved. I thought it was great. It was very soap, it was very soap opera, but um, I thought it was really good. And then they asked us if we do a tour. And we said, well... Why not? Yeah, all right then. <laughs> <laughs> when the opportunity when the opportunity arose, it was it was very much well assessing it in one's life and going, well, that seems if we're ever going to do this, I think it has to be now, with the sort of whole nostalgia of Culture Club and the eighties coming back, and uh, because because Culture Club left a bitter taste in my mouth, I really looked at this as an opportunity to you know get get rid of that and sweetened my my whole attitude towards the band. And um, when I came, I came, flew in from LA to see George, um, because basically we had to find out before we could even do it, how we were gonna get along, you know? And like George said earlier, it was very much, we sort of just got in a room together and it was like we'd never been apart. And that was, that was a very nice thing. So Culture Club, why now? I mean, it, it really is just a question of us being in a place where everybody can do this and enjoy it rather than just it be everything you know it used to be everything culture club was like Arr! it's the right time I mean, the yeah. time yeah. for some reason seems to be right isn't it yeah. things have gone very quiet music and fashion go around in cycles of about 15 years and uh sure enough you know the 80s have come back round god knows what the 90s are going to be about in the year 2010 but well, they, but because, um because we're a bit <clears throat> premature as well when we, when we split up we didn't split up we sort of blew up didn't we we just collapsed basically and I think a lot of the emphasis was on 
the problems, and we're, we're sort of very much a pop group, and I think now people are realising the songs have stood up the test of time, and we can play. And that's one of the things that's a difference. There's, there haven't been, I mean, there haven't been that many bands in the last three years. You had Oasis and a few others, but in the 80s there were so many groups. You wouldn't have two or three groups, you'd have five, six, seven groups, and they would keep going, at least have three albums out. And I think that there's a desire for real songs now, and a bit of, you know, Lighten up. Theatre. Bit of lighten up. Theatre, that's the word I'm grovelling for here. <laughs> uh, just to lighten up. It's been a bit miserable, a bit serious, you know. George, your image has always dominated the band. Thank God someone's got a hat. Got over front. <laughs> always got over good Imagine front. Imagine if there were two of us in the band. Got over two front. Two Georges. <laughs> got over good front, man. Get out there, sing. Put the hat on. Put the dreadlocks on. Lovely. Go off you go. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the thing is, for, for me, you know, dressing up, you know, before I started Culture Club, before I, we started Culture Club, I was far more outrageous than I am now. I mean, you know, I had to tone it down, really, just for the purpose of travelling, because I wouldn't have been able to carry boxes of, uh, you know, my Queen Bodicea outfit, my Carmen Miranda outfit. I mean, it just wouldn't have been practical. And people actually thought, when we started, that my look was really outrageous, but it was actually really toned down look to what I wore every day. And I think the difference also is that, you know, when you, when you get a reunion of a band like Kiss, everybody knows that they're just kind of really dressing up and they take their makeup off and they're a bunch of lads which is not the case with me. I'm not a lad. So are the rest of you guys lads then? Well, they want to be, but they're not really. No. <laughs> We're men trapped in men's bodies. No, I'm not a lad, I'm a dad. Yeah. I'm a, I'm dad. a lad. I'm a dad. You're he is a lad. No, he is a lad. <laughs> I'm a lad, I'm proud of it. <coughs> it's the Essex in me. Does the fact that the rest of you are dads make you feel any more responsible these days? No. Well, <laughs> only, only, only when I get yeah, a school until report. The tour, yeah. I'm sort of serious for about 10 minutes when I get the school reports then. And I'm a lad again. <laughs> I tell you, it was actually difficult getting back onto the road, sort of ten years, twelve years after you know being apart. You know, having been a dad for t twelve years and then suddenly jumping into being a pop star again, that was quite, uh, quite a trip. The first few weeks of the tour. My daughter's <laughs> twelve, and initially she was very embarrassed because she thought, <laughs> "Daddy's, oh my God, what are all my friends going to say at Beverly Hills <laughs> School?" And uh, now she's there's something funny about Culture Club. It's we're almost cool again because we've been gone for so long and because particularly with George being you know the man about town that he is he's kept a very good credibility about himself which I think has transferred back to Culture Club so there's, it, there's something quite cool about it and she's, get, she's starting to get that a little bit I want my son to know what her like what daddy does or did Said when he's Not 13. everything. So, no, no, well, no, that's what I was going to say. Otherwise, when he's 13, Daddy's going to be hiding those pictures of that bloke dressed like a woman, you know. <laughs> what do you do, Dad? What's the main difference between Culture Club then and now? I think the difference between Culture Club then and now is... About £400, I think. <laughs> <laughs> More than that, probably. Um, older. Older, but not too much, you know. The same. We can still perform. It's, uh, it, was, it was very interesting getting back on stage. I was at stage fright for about three shows, then I suddenly realised, you know what, this, this is fun. And particularly when we got into the States and people started just going mad. It was very odd. I'm like, don't scream at me, I'm 37. Yeah. You know? And um, then I was like, no, no, go ahead and scream. This could be fun. We started running around on the stage again. and I was like, yeah, this is great. What, a, what an opportunity to get out that youthfulness that still fights to get out all the time. It's like playing with your kid every, you know, you go out and for an hour and a half, you get to just act out. It's brilliant. When we first discussed doing this tour, you know, it was like six, seven months before we actually did it. And as it got, got nearer and nearer, I began to get really terrified. And then once we were doing it, it was like, this is really weird. I kept getting very strange deja vu every day and uh, it just didn't feel like it was any different. And now that I'm home, I can't even believe that I've done it. It was really strange. Mm -hmm. Certainly a lot less stressful. I mean, you know, I, I did enjoy it. Really, really enjoyed it. And I don't normally enjoy touring at all. I think it was, it was so <clears throat> stressful then. I only realise now how stressful it was before. And I think I'm glad you said that. I feel exactly the same. I was building up to this tour. I was like, oh my God, I haven't been on tour for 10 years, packing the suitcase. And then it just went. We've done it. And we're back. And then we'll be off again. That's why it's quite strange doing this interview today because it's almost thrown back into it. You've definitely got the two lives. I'm just warming up the there. The thing is now, everybody, <laughs> everybody's reached a place in their lives where we all know ourselves really well. And so when you're in a position where everyone's kind of comfortable in, with their own lives and what they're doing, so Culture Club isn't 
what's what is there to lose there's everything to gain mm. you know there's the experience and, and the strength in the band mm. and that's 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 what it is I mean if we go out if we you know do a few more gigs and go you know what I'm not even fun anymore that's it so what and we, we don't have that <laughs> pressure of being we don't have that pressure of being trendy anymore you know what I mean like if you're you know a current band you know you, you, we've had loads of ups and downs in our career so we don't have that pressure of being trendy if we make a bad record and it doesn't sell, so what? We can make another one. Because really, at this stage, you're only as good as the record you make, and that's it. Whereas if you're a band like the Spire Skills or an up-and-coming band like All Saints or Bewitched, it's much more of an uphill struggle. We've already been down the dumper more times than you can care to mention. So it, it, it's, it's a place I know well, and it's a place that I've crawled out of many times. So it doesn't bother me that much, you know what I mean? I think, you know, if we do something and it's, it's not accepted, then we can go back to the drawing board mm. without all that pressure of being a new, new artist, which I think is much tougher. But I think, uh, I think the reason everybody mm. felt that uh, getting back together, there wasn't much difference between then and now, is because there's a kind of timelessness about Culture Club, in particular the material. Uh, when we got together and started rehearsing, the songs just sounded so fresh, you mm. know, and, and that really said to us, yeah, this is going to work. Did you get back together for the many? First of all... Um, there are no guarantees as far as money's concerned. There were lots of stories in the paper that said we've been offered a million pounds or three million pounds. That's not true. When you do a tour like this, you get a guaranteed fee per night. And if you, if you do better than that, then you make money. So there was never any kind of guarantees of big you know, cash handouts or anything like that. And I think also when you say you're doing things for the money, what you're really doing is trashing the real reasons you know, rock and roll isn't about money, it's about emotional needs, it's about healing in a way. I mean, I think sometimes you have to go back into a situation to understand it. When we first started rehearsing, I found myself getting angry, sad, you know, bored, you know, being happy. All these kind of emotions that weren't really tangible. I couldn't say why I felt that way. It was just that the songs were stirring up stuff that was laying dormant. And also a lot of the songs that we've performed as Culture Club... I haven't sung those songs in years. I mean, I've done a handful of songs in my own shows, but doing stuff like Black Money or That's The Way, um, you know, it was, it was really an interesting experience because you forget how emotional those songs are because they're stories, they're personal stories, and so it, it always kind of evokes emotion whether you want it to or not. But then you get past that stage and you actually start enjoying it, and I feel... From my point of view, you know, I can sing the songs with much more conviction now. I can sing Victims uh, with much more feeling because I've been down a very rocky path and I can come back to those songs and actually sing them with real understanding of, of the words. John, most of these songs are written about you and your relationship with George. Does that make it hard to go back to them now? For me, it was very difficult emotionally, doing the band back together. I have a, a wife now and a baby. It's very weird being... In a one, <laughs> don't pull the face, don't let me kill you. But uh, the so I didn't realise, especially songs like Black Money, uh, I was playing them, I just thought, oh my God, I don't think I'm going to get through this. They're more emotional now than they were then. But after you've been on tour and you've played them about 50 times, it's not so emotional after that. It's you just enjoy... The little you, denial switch back on. No, 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 you enjoy, you enjoy <laughs> playing I think more. that's an interesting... What, Interesting yeah, word denial because I think there was a lot of denial in the early days. I mean, not we a river in Africa. We weren't a, a sort of, we weren't one of those bands that ever sat down and kind of made ground rules or discussed emotional issues. We literally, I mean, as a writer, I dealt with them in <coughs> lyrics. That's how I dealt with them. And there were times when I would know, write songs that were really bitter, and nobody would ever sort of question or say, "Well, what's that oh, about?" Because nice. most of the time it was kind of obvious because <laughs> the song would sort of come after a fight or. A situation, literally the next day, we'd have... Well, that's enough, shut up. You know, a song. <laughs> and, I, and, and I think there's been some really weird kind of ironies in Culture Club. I mean, the day that we got to number one with Do Really Want to Help Me, we were in Scotland. Well, and then John and I had a massive fight. We were in this hideous sort of hotel with like an orange candle bedspread, you know, sort of stains on the wall. We had a massive fight and I was going to leave the band. That was it. I was packing my bags in the morning... Morning came, out came the champagne, we were number one. And that was really the stuff of Culture Club, that we'd have these ridiculous dramas where I would leave, that was, I'm leaving! <laughs> and, uh, you know, and everyone would say, oh, God, after a certain point, everyone would say, go on then, leave. <laughs> <laughs> was, there was a lot of that, you know, there was one. a lot of that sort of drama, and then 
incredible sort of good news the next minute. See, yeah. I didn't know any of that. Yeah. I didn't know you had the round and we were going to leave the band. Rouse, I was the busy, row of rouse. Busy with four young Scottish girls and a bottle of champagne <laughs> in the other room. <laughs> How is the relationship between the two of you nowadays? I think that there may come a stage in the future where John and I can actually have a conversation beyond the sort of one-liners and a barrage of jokes. We haven't really got to that stage yet, but I think we will. That's up to you. I like his kid and I like his girlfriend. <laughs> I get on better with them than I do with him. I mean, his girlfriend's lovely. I could actually become quite good friends with her because she's really sweet and chatty and stuff. John's, I think John's reserved. Definitely. I'm amazed that I could come back into this group and, and feel kind of comfortable. Because, you know, when, this, when the idea for this tour first came up, my immediate reaction was, no, John. Um, I said, I'm not working with him. And then I went home, sat down with some friends of mine, and they were like, oh, you're just being bitchy, you know. And I said, yeah, I suppose I am. So I called up the next morning and said, well, there's no point doing Culture Club without him. But it was odd, you know, that the morning that we went to my manager's office to meet up, it was like, I actually called up from my house and said, I'm not coming. And John did the same thing. And my, and my manager said, was like, everybody's well. here. And I said, I'm not coming. And then I went, joke. I and he did exactly the same thing. <laughs> yeah. He called our manager and, and said, I'm not coming, joke. Yeah. <laughs> and so George just did that. So, I, I mean, the thing is, it can't be Culture Club without John. It can't be Culture Club no, without, also, you know, without George, unless George Michael wants to do it. But, yeah, you know. he's not doing it. Yeah, <laughs> but we Sorry. can, but but we can I replace Roy. <laughs> I, didn't want to, I didn't want to do it originally, and then I remember I was actually driving that Malibone Road, and I thought, well, sod this, I thought, well, you know, I'm going to do it. It's my band as much as everybody else's. You know? The whole John and me thing, I mean, it's, it's interesting yeah. for a lot of people, and I think that it's interesting to me. I mean, it's... The whole twistedness of it is very appealing to me. And, and then I think my, my kind of motto is enough adventures and you have a life. You know, people say, but why are you doing this again? I said, well, it was suggested. And on that day, it sounded like a good idea. You know, and I don't really feel like I need to give an explanation. I mean, it's just such a mad idea to go back into a band with your ex-boyfriend and two people you haven't seen for 13 years. I mean, that, if that's not twisted, what is, you know? So I thought, yeah, I've got to do it. Just to see whether I can. Very colourful band, that's the thing. It's, it's great, isn't it? That's what, it's a miracle that we're back together. Just, that's enough at the moment. It's a miracle. Fact, it's a miracle. That's what I saw. It's a miracle. What went wrong with Culture Club first time round? For me, where we went wrong as a band was that we stopped being kind of organic and got too electronic. You know, by the third album, we, we, I'd stopped really writing stories. I was just writing anything. I was writing songs for the sake of songs rather than writing about my experiences and writing about my relationship with John or, or whatever, you know, things that were from my heart. And I think that was the problem. And, I, I, you know, what I'd like to do in the future is, is really concentrate on, on being emotional with the songs rather than sort of being clever. Tell us about your new material in the set, like the new single, I Just Want to Be Loved. Well, that was an old song that we wrote eight years ago. We haven't really written anything new. Georgia uh, had a song that he'd wrote, uh, how many years ago, a couple of years About ago? About two years ago. About two years ago, which he proposed to us and said, well, you know, do you think we could take this on the tour with us? And we said, yeah. And um, so was we've got... civilised? Yeah. <laughs> well, for me it was, because it's a great song. It's called Strange Voodoo. And uh, for me, really, this, is a, this tour is a means to an end. Hopefully we'll get on to a new album. And if it takes the direction of uh, Strange Voodoo, um, I think it'd be a great album. You know. But, I mean, the writing process has always been fraught, you know, and uh, we've always argued because, obviously, when you start a band, you have a very clear idea about what you want it to be, and then, of course, you have the other members, and they all come in with their musical ideas and their influences, and it become, in a way, Culture Club became a much more interesting band because of all those different ideas. It certainly didn't turn out to be the band that I wanted to be in originally, but... Now, looking back, it, it was a much better idea than the one, the one I had. But I think in terms of writing, yeah, I mean, I don't think there'd be any point just doing this, you know, sort of nostalgia tour and, and it not leading anywhere because I'm not a nostalgia freak. I mean, I've spent the last 10 years trying to escape from my past because people tend to hold you in a certain place, particularly if you're a musician. So I spent a long time hating the whole Culture Club thing running away from it, you know, refusing to do certain songs. But when, we, this, the, when the idea for this tour came up, m immediately I said, well, I don't just want it to be a tour, because that would be like Jerry and the Pacemakers, you know. I want to actually make a new record, because I think for us that would represent a very massive creative challenge.
to actually go and do another great record because we only really did one great record, yeah. Colour by Numbers. That was yeah. the best record we ever yeah. did. Yeah, I think when the band sort of demised around sort of 86, um, there was so much more left that we could have done and we now have the opportunity to do that. And so I'm really looking forward I, to getting on to... I think it would have been harder if it was five years after we'd broken up to write, but because it's been such a long time, we're probably back to square one in a way. Mm. I, I just think that everybody's gone, out, gone away and, and got all of their... Uh, personal things out of the way not just in life but also in terms of music I mean I couldn't write anymore with Culture Club I, I, after Colour by Numbers I was burned anyway we worked so hard and did so much that uh, I didn't have any more songs in me and also I didn't want to do I didn't want to do Culture Club then so we all kind of forced Culture Club for a while um, to be quite honest I don't know if creatively I, I mean, everybody had to go away. George, George got his uh, albums out of the way. John had other bands. Mikey did his things. I did a solo album. I've been doing film and television music. I've produced. I've written songs. So I'm in a place now where the thought of actually writing songs with Culture Club, as daunting as it is, it's also quite exciting. The best songs of Culture Club are written like that, where, ev- where somebody did something that inspired somebody else and that just went round the room. Church of the Poison Mind was written, bang, it was like a Kids from Fame session. John just started going, bang, 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 and Mike was like, oh man, I've got a piano. <laughs> George started singing, you know, and then obviously he went away and developed the lyrics, but the song, the essence of the song was literally written in about three minutes. Do You Really Want to Hurt Me, Rhythm Machine, Rhythm Box turned on, started playing some chords. George started coming up with a melody, bass line, bang, it's done. And all of the great Culture Club songs were done like that, including Just Wanna Be Loved, the new signal, yeah. single. It was very instant. It was like, let's do this thing, grooving, lovers rock, bang. And... Hopefully, it's been enough time and there's enough ideas within, within us all that when we sit down to actually do that, it will be like that. Because we've never been cerebral. If we, if we start thinking too much, we did start thinking too much. You can tell on the last two albums. Musically, they're very intricate, but there's no soul there. And I think, um, you know, hopefully, the, like George has been through a lot, I've been through a lot, everyone's been through a lot more life. If we can bring that together with that sort of naive charm that Culture Club had musically as well. You know, who knows what could happen? But I, I think it's, there's definitely songs in us again. And there's no competition, really. There isn't anybody else, you know, like us. We were never like any of the other bands in the 80s. I mean, we got lumped in with the whole new romantic thing, but we weren't new romantic, we weren't electronic. Our music was very organic. Mm-hmm. We weren't like Duran Duran, we weren't selling kudos and we weren't doing videos with, probably much to Roy's disappointment, with lots of leggy beauties and <laughs> bottles of champagne and yachts. I never, ever felt that we were like any of those other bands. You know, I never felt that we had the same message, the same attitude or anything. So, you know, in that respect, we're not like those other 80s bands because we didn't have a distinctive sound. Either. What, was the, what was the inspiration? Well, I just want to be like, it's, it's, a, it's about John. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a song about saying goodbye to somebody and moving on from a situation. I mean, we wrote it in 1990. And at that time, there was, I think, a lot more bad blood between all of us, you know, and that's why it never got off the ground. It never, ever got off the ground because there was too much anger and frustration and bitterness. So it's weird to, be, to record that song. I mean, I don't think anyone's ever asked me what it's about because it's so obvious what it's about, I think. Do You Want to Hurt Me was very like, oh, woe is me. You know, all the early songs were about being a victim. And I think I Just Want to Be Loved is, is me saying that I know what I want now. You know, I've, I, and, in, and in that respect, I've moved on as a writer because I don't, I try not to write about being a victim anymore. Although, you know, there is always going to be melancholy in what I write because I don't do happy very well. I find it very hard to write happy songs. And I think the interesting thing about Culture Club is all the songs appeared to be very jolly. They had a kind of jolly surface, but the undercurrent was, was always quite sad, which I think is, is, again, another one of those contradictions about this band. Started Culture Club, what sort of band did you want to be? I wanted to be Bowie. I wanted to be dangerously weird, you know, hairless, living on the edge. I wanted to be the kind of artist that your mother didn't want you to go and see, but that's not what happened. <laughs> you were a mother kind as well. <laughs> yeah. 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 Made a temporary mistake and did Culture Club. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, I think uh, when, when, when the four of us actually got together eventually, um, we were sort of a left of field, new romantic type band. And John, who had been playing sort of punk, gobspitting rock, uh, decided that he was fed up with that and that we should go in a pop direction. And it was really when you arrived that uh, 
You're responsible. The original, the original name was Sex Gang Children. We were called yeah. the Sex Gang Children. That's See, I, I had a very brief stint in Bow Wow Wow working with Michael McLaren. So you won't get hit with that one. No. And, and I said, oh, I want to call the band the Sex Gang Children. So it gives you an idea of what I wanted. To also, in Praise of Lemmings was another name, wasn't in it? Praise yeah, of Lemmings, yeah, but that was a bit too dreary. And I think it was John that said, well, I think what happened was that John bought me a Hasidic hat, because I was big on hats. He bought me this proper Hasidic hat. And that sort of started the idea of Culture Club. And John said, look at us, you know, Irish Queen, Jew, big old Anglo-Saxon, and a Jamaican. So it really made sense to, to call the band Culture Club. I think we, we toyed around with, like, Can't Wait Club or Caravan Club, because I wanted this idea of movement. But then Culture Club sounded the most sensible. Yeah. Toilet Club. <laughs> <laughs> Closet Club. <laughs> How did the three guys ever feel that George grabbed the limelight at the expense of the band? I was angry for a while about it, but George had such a powerful image that, of course, the media were going to pick up on that and write about it. It, it became too much too, too quickly because everybody wanted a piece of George and there wasn't enough left creatively for, for us it and the time on the image too, too much. No, I, think a lot, I think a lot of it was that, you know, when you get successful really quickly, I mean, Culture Club happened really quickly. And you don't have anything to kind of measure it by. You know, you just literally ride the wave. So we were doing so much publicity because you, you almost have this feeling that it's all going to disappear overnight. So you do all this stuff. We didn't understand the, the idea of supply and demand, you know. And, I, and, and in a way, you know, that wouldn't have worked for us. Being mysterious like Prince or Michael Jackson would not have worked for us. But I think my need for publicity was just insatiable at a certain point. I mean, I think that a lot, of, a lot of celebrities become victims of their own media. And I think what happened to me is that my need for publicity kind of went far and beyond, you know, the necessary things that were needed to promote the band. It was like, I just got eaten up by it. And um, I think that's what's changed. You know, I don't, you know, I don't sort of go out, you know, now sort of deliberately trying to get a photograph, which I did in the 80s. I mean, I literally thought about it every day. <laughs> I thought, what can I do now <laughs> to get publicity? <laughs> and, and I think what happens is that I got crucified by the very thing that I, I kind of craved. So there was a lesson in that for me. You know, I, I got killed by the press, if you like. They sort of created the monster and they destroyed the monster. But as I've got older, I've realised that I had much more of a hand in that than I ever thought. You know, I could, have, I could have changed it if I wanted to. I think our big problem is about we were too available. You know, and most bands, you see, most bands aren't interesting and they don't have anything to say. And when you do, everybody wants to have you on, you know, and everybody wants to interview you. And we were doing, like, in-flight magazine and things like that. You know, we were going to the opening of a toilet seat, or I was, anyway. And I think that's, you know, that's what's changed now. You know, the way that I look at my career now is very differently. And I think that also affects us. You know, I don't have that hunger anymore, so it's different. The dresses have gone, but I see you've kept the hat and dreadlocks, George. Is dressing up still important to you? My way of dressing is how I feel on the day. You know what I mean? I mean, I've, I've, I don't wear this every day. And I don't... You're lucky you got the hat. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I don't wear it. No, I mean, dressing up for me isn't, it isn't about just about the sort of the band. It's just about making myself look nicer. That's, you know, I've done that since I was 13. I looked at myself when I was 13. I had no shoulders, curly hair, hated the way I looked. And I've spent the last... God knows how many years, making myself look more exotic. It may not be somebody else's idea of, of beauty, but it's mine. I like the, curly the way hair. I look. Yeah. I mean, like, it's, it's, it's odd when, you know, because I think w women ask me that a lot. They say, why do you wear makeup? Well, for the same reason you do. You know, same reason why any other woman wears makeup, although I'm not female, but I have the mind of a female. <laughs> and the body of a bricklayer. <laughs> What do you remember as a highlight of those early years? The first number one you have, you never forget, also Top of the Pops. Mm. It was amazing. But I can't remember the rest. I mean, hearing that countdown, <laughs> you know, <laughs> 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, Culture Club. That was... Yeah, having, having a number one and being on Top of the Pops. But I think, I think originally, like, the first time we got played on the radio, I mean, we got played on the Peter Powell show. We did a session, and for me, that was just, like, proof. I mean, I, I had to call everybody that I knew in the world and have them listen to the radio between, you know, sort of, was it about six and eight to make sure they heard us. And it was like, finally proof that we were a real band, that I actually did something other than dress up. And it was, that was one of the highlights. And also having the first ever record. 
like having the first ever piece of vinyl sleeve with the Culture Club. Playing, yeah. playing Madison Square Gardens was just insane. I mean, how, how we could have been this little band starting in clubs, you know, Essex. being like a little hip. Yeah, playing in clubs in, in Essex toothbrush. and London, playing, you know, to a like, hip London crowd and then ending up playing to 20,000 people in, New- in Madison Square Garden was amazing. Winning a Grammy was incredible. I look at my Grammy now, people come in my, my studio in LA and they go, wow. And I'm like, oh yeah, wow. You know, that's, that's a big thing, you know. And, but the, but the, the funny thing is, because we were so wrapped up in it and the whole drama and the whole, okay, we could, that was number one, but the next one has to be number one. And it was all that insanity. And that's why now is, to do it again is so much fun because... You know, when you're young, you know, you know one thing I realise you never really get to fully enjoy your success because you think, right, we've got to do the next thing, which is actually the right way to think to a certain extent. And now that we're older, that's the burden's been taken off. But it is weird; you never actually really fully enjoy the success. That very much, you know, destroyed us in the end. It was just we were just rushing at 100 miles yeah, an hour. Yeah, we just picked up. Too in fast, particular, yeah. the third album suffered. I mean, we wrote and recorded it in six weeks. I enjoyed making the first two albums, and I enjoyed touring and playing live I hated making videos and I used to run away from it you know and that's why to have oh, an opportunity to now you've changed no no you know what but now you know now you know what I can say I don't like I don't like I don't like doing press I don't particularly enjoy doing press you know I'll come here and, and it's fine you know and, and I'll do it but you know I'm 37 years of age now I don't really care you know I'm kind of happy what I do now and and that's why at this time I'm determined I'm going to enjoy Culture Club, and if it stops becoming <laughs> if it stops becoming fun, I'm not going to do it anymore. One thing you have to remember that it's work. I mean, you think of being a pop no, or being work. successful. It can't be work. Well, of course, it, work you don't get God. something for nothing in life, no, right? So you know, because there isn't enough here well, to so make anything, it work. Anything that doesn't. I, I've worked. I've anything just worked you don't for enjoy. Years. If you stop enjoying something, no, you I've just worked for twelve years. Fair when enough. I when okay. I compose for film and television, I'm working. You know, when I'm doing this, I don't want to see it as work. If it becomes work, you can't, you can't look at rock and roll as work or pop music as no, work. No, no, I don't mean weird, but you know what I mean. There are, thing, are some things that you don't want to do to make the things that you want to do happen. That's right. what I mean. Yeah. yeah, it have to be done. Right. Yeah, I mean, obviously, travelling when you're on tour and stuff, that's, yeah. that's work, but it's for something that you really enjoy doing. That's yeah, what of course, I'm saying. But that's what I'm saying. Is you have to do some things right. you don't want to do to make the things you want to do work. Right. Yeah. That's all. There you are, you've got a round. I, I think it's all about kind of striking a balance. You know, I mean, it is work, however, way you, whatever way you look at it. There are certain aspects of what we do that, that are work. Well, me too, mate. But if you, if, you, if you compare it with what other people have to do to earn a living, it isn't work. Of course not. But, you know, there are certain aspects of, of, of being in a band. You know, you talk about it more than you actually do it. It's a bit like sex. You know, you spend all your time talking about what you do and then you spend an hour on stage or three minutes on TV or a minute on TV talking about it. It's all about hanging around and waiting in rock and roll. How are you coping with life on the road second time round? I went everywhere by road in America because that's how I like to do it. I like to be in tour bus because it's like a sanctuary. Once you've done the gig, you get in your tour bus and nobody can bother you. You haven't got to be worried about people following you into the hotel. You know, you're just there in your little world and you go off to the next gig. And for me, like, swimming every day is essential on the road because it's good for the voice. I'm a vegetarian, so just trying to find healthy things to eat. You know, it's, it's, it's a real battle, particularly in America. You really have to hunt around for a yeah, decent meal. In America, that's horrible. Yeah, and getting English cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> I had people like flying in <laughs> cigarettes, like people that were doing interviews. You can come and do an interview, but you have to bring some duty free. Um, but I think, you know, you just really have to just accept that you're going to be away for six weeks and life isn't going to be how you normally live it. And you just kind of sink into it and it's great mm. fun. I mean, I really did enjoy it. Mm. I was sad when we got to the end. It was like two more gigs and I got really depressed. It's like two more gigs. I thought it was longer. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a weird thing. It's like when you go on holiday. You always enjoy the last three days the most. What is it like to walk back on stage after 13 years? Well, we did Monte Carlo. So we did three nights in Monte Carlo where we were basically Deep playing... France. We, we were playing to sort of millionaires and their younger girlfriends, their courtesans. So, and it was very staid. People clapped very politely and they didn't react and they spoke French. So a lot of the humour went over their heads. So going to Atlanta, where it was like 9,000 people, everybody knew the songs. They were, you know, they were ready after we had the Human League on first, and, you know, that was a real pop event. So it was just, it was like a return to form, you know. I mean, I've I've done a lot of gigs since I've left Culture Club, but I haven't done gigs to that capacity and with that much warmth. Like George said, when the crowd in Atlanta 
they were just they were going crazy before we even came on the stage. And the moment the lights went down, it was mm. like mayhem. Mm. Mm. And I was I was like, whoa, it's very exciting. Yeah, I think I think it, that, take, it takes a little while to find your feet. You know, having been away from the stage for God knows how long. I mean, none of us have done apart from John. George has done about 400 gigs away from us, so it was okay for him. But uh, for us, it was quite it was quite nerve wracking. But the audiences were amazing, very absolutely amazing. I mean, when we did the Storytellers VH1 <coughs> show, I remember it's probably one of the most emotional moments of my life when we walked back on that stage to play again after all this time, and we'd rehearsed, and it, suddenly the cameras were on, the crowd was there, and out we walked. And I just, I hadn't, I wasn't anticipating how I felt at all. I just went, <gasps> you know, and my heart was in my mouth and it was, it was, very it, oh, it was incredible. Yeah, yeah. But in a really exciting way, I was like, well, I had no idea it was going to do this to me. Who came to the shows? We had quite a lot of new audience, which was very interesting and encouraging. And they were singing along with the songs as well. I mean, as though they knew them yeah, first time around. Kids, didn't they? Yeah, lots of kids were there, which is wonderful. It was brilliant. So at least 25% were new audience throughout the whole tour which was uh, encouraging. You know, there were kids there, but from about 17 to 50, probably 20% gay, a um, lot of couples, a lot of people re just wanted to revisit their Reagan and Thatcher years and have a fun time in nostalgia land and so they came you know, to scream at their old icons, you know? <laughs> Don't scream at me, I'm 37. All right, then. <laughs> Thank you. And why did you decide on Church of the Poison Mind as your opener and Karma Chameleon as your uncle. Some songs are easy to kind of set up the sound with and Church of the Poison Mind is quite straightforward in that respect. So that's quite a good song. You know, it's up, energetic, but without being too complicated. So that's a good opener for us. And Karma Chameleon is a great song because, you know, it leaves people on a high. You know, it really does. I mean, it's just one of those weird songs because I never ever considered it to be one of the greatest songs we ever wrote. But for some reason, people have a lot of affection for that song. And you watch people in the crowd literally going mad, jumping around, singing the words. And it's, it's just strange. It's, it's really strange. It is a strange one. It's definitely struck a chord in people with that song. There's something yeah. about it. It just It's like a nursery rhyme. Mm. It just has that... Different Don't you find you sit for a different name? I do, yeah. I used to I hate that song. I mean, it's quite famous, though. I wasn't a particular fan of <laughs> Karma Camille. It's quite a famous story. Very famous. But, it's a country um, song. I'll tell you in a country. moment. Although when, 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 when the royalties came in, he bought himself a nice house in Bel Air. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean... You didn't know. give him to charity. <laughs> well, I didn't, didn't hate, I didn't hate you that much. <laughs> no, no. I... You have other US states. When we do United Kingdom, we're very excited because we're going to have the Human League and ABC with us. So it's going to be a great show. In yeah. December. Yeah. We're just waiting at the moment to, to see... I mean, we've got, we got touring until the end of this year. And then we'll see how we feel. You know, we'll see... Maybe in the summertime would be a good time to do Europe, do some of the festivals and mm -hmm. things like that. That'd be nice. I'd love Coach Club to do Glastonbury. That would be the biggest thrill of my life. I'd love to do that. I think we'll probably go to Japan and Australia and possibly South America as well. I don't think you know about this yet, Not George. Not for a while, though. Not for <laughs> Next a while. Week, actually. <laughs> I'd rather, I actually rather, I'd rather do some recording oh. and then go out on the back of a new record rather than just go out on a kind of, you know, nostalgia trip around the rest of the world. So it's really, it's more with, with us with, now, it's just one step at a time. How much of your life is now taken up with Culture Club and are you still pursuing other projects? Everything's on hold Yeah, for this. Not for, <laughs> Not for me. Not for me either, actually, well, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> I'm off DJing this weekend. I've got, gigs. I've got gigs. In between all our dates, I've got DJing gigs and I'll be doing that whenever there's a spare space. I yeah. mean, apart from, all, all we'll be doing in between is writing, but mainly, you know, we'll be touring. Yeah, I mean, we'll be given, writing individually. Given sufficient space. I would. I'd like to keep my hand in with the film and television thing. Let's keep your hand in. What yeah, because you? you know it's one of those things. Keep your hand in your pocket. It's, con it's constantly evolving in that world, and you know I work with a company that's you know right in there. So every time I go back, I have to you know get in the studio and do some things just to keep to keep my head in that space as well. What's the latest news on the film of your autobiography, George? The movie of my autobiography is in progress. It's. Um, hopefully going to be starting either the end of this year or beginning of next year. At the moment, the script's done. And there are certain people who've been talked to about playing roles, number one being Julie Waters, who hopefully is going to be my mum. And at the moment, uh, some American companies are getting involved to sort of, you know, add money to the project because you can't really start filming until we've got enough millions to do so. 
but that should happen pretty soon. I'm quite excited about that. I think that the idea is to get somebody unknown to play me and get everybody else, all the supporting actors, to be sort of big names. If you could change anything about your career, would you? I don't think there's any point whatsoever in uh, changing what's happened because you don't learn from, you know, you, you learn more from the sort of awful things that happen. And I think Culture Club was always a mixture of, like, elation and misery. Even the kind of drug aspect of my career, I don't really regret. I mean, I don't think you have to kind of cut off your ear to become enlightened. I don't think it's a route you have to take. And if I had my chance all over again, it's certainly something I wouldn't repeat. But again, I think you learn more from the sort of bad periods in your life than you do from the good. This is incredible. We survived. The fact that we survived, the four of us can be here now and, and still make music is just incredible. It's, to me, that's so amazing that we're just even here.